You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to help you build a website and run your business. At Event Horizon, we're always looking for ways to streamline production. Squarespace is the type of product that can make your life easier, with the ability to build a page using pre-designed structures for specific purposes such as contact, about, blog, portfolio, products, and more. Page elements are arranged to quickly create professional layouts and showcase your content. Add or remove blocks to create a custom look. And if you need help, Squarespace offers email support 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All customer care team members are employees in their offices and typically respond to help requests in about an hour. Do go over to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash event horizon to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now, enjoy this special preview of this week's Event Horizon. I recently read a paper, actually it's probably been several years now, where the idea was floated of piggybacking radio signals on top of celestial events. So in other words, if you see a supernova cook off, look for a signal because the aliens might have timed it <laughs> so that and everybody would know when to look. So what about um, sort of uh, serendipity as far as signals go? Would can we would we even be able to determine such a thing because it's just so transient? Yeah, well, a lot of these ideas have been cooked up, and the one you mentioned, supernova, is a particularly good example. Look, you know, uh, you're on some alien planet, and a supernova goes off in the sky. Every astronomer on your planet will aim their telescopes of whatever type in the direction of the supernova because supernovae are very interesting phenomena you want to learn more about them but some of them might figure hey look we're looking at this supernovae and everybody behind us is going to be looking at that supernovae too right uh, maybe not immediately because they're farther from it for example but they will look in the direction of the supernovae so if they're really behind us as opposed to in some other direction if they're really behind us why don't we just wait a half day and turn some transmitters on in the direction behind us and say, hey, you know, while you're studying the supernovae, you know, we'd just like to check in where the Klingons. So that kind of, if you will, uh, special event or special circumstance has also been suggested as uh, something maybe useful to the search for ET. And efficient because you don't need to have a screaming, energy hungry, omnidirectional beacon running 24 <laughs> 7 you just serendipitously you know place your signal in front of something that everybody's going to see right now also when doing SETI searches is the focus specifically on planets in other words do you say that star system probably has a planet on it that's the place we need to look but could it also simply be that aliens hang out where we're not looking out in deep space, you know, or something like that. And how would you go about looking for that if, if that were the case? Yeah, personally, I think that, uh, you know, what you just said makes a lot of sense. I mean, we do tend to look in the direction of star systems that are either known to have planets or are the kind of star systems that we've seen have planets in other directions. We, we, we know about, I don't know, four to 5,000 planets around other stars. That's the total. And of course, you could look in the direction of those star systems that have planets. But doggone, the biggest takeaway from the whole study of exoplanets is that most stars have planets. That's kind of simplified the strategy quite a bit because now you don't have to know, well, did, does this star system have planets or not? And if, they, if it has planets, are they the kind of planets where you might expect life or whatever? You just look at as many star systems as you can because most star systems, maybe 80% of them, have planets. That doesn't mean all these planets are really great places for life, but some of them will be. So, you know, that's that's actually simplified the search quite a bit because now you just look at basically all the nearby stars. So say you get a signal, right? In determining that signal, what it is, which it could just be some alien's internal communication that you'll never figure out, 
or whatever it is. But what other things as far as other techno signatures could you employ? So say you get it. Do you then look for the vegetative red edge or, or what, where do you go from there as far as studying this alien civilization and trying to figure anything you can out about them? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, if you picked up a signal, say we picked up a signal tonight, right? The coordinates for the star system where we picked up the signal, they would be public knowledge because, you know, you have to tell people at another observatory, presumably even in another country, the coordinates for them to check the signal in the first place. So there's nothing secret about where it is on the sky. And you can bet that anybody with any kind of telescope will be looking in that direction. And one thing they might want to find out very quickly, use some big optical telescopes, you know, mirror and lens telescopes to determine, well, uh, you know, are there planets around that star system? And if so, what what kind? And if, if you have have the capability, yes, you would use very big optical telescopes to try and find that planet and then determine, well, does it have oxygen in its atmosphere? Or is there some spectral indication that there's photosynthesis going on uh, on that planet, that kind of thing. All these studies would, of course, be pursued. And if any of them got anywhere, you can be sure there'd be a lot of money made available for building new telescopes that could tell us more. Now, as a natural result of SETI, and you've done this for a long time, are peripheral scientific discoveries made in radio astronomy as a result of SETI? In other words, can you look at a SETI data set and see some sort of weird natural signal of which you have to figure out what it is. Has that happened? I, I don't think it actually has happened. And that's somewhat surprising because the history of astronomy and in particular radio astronomy was that every time you built an instrument which had a, you know, a special capability, in the case of SETI uh, radio telescopes, the special ability is the fact that you can look at hundreds of millions, even more channels, uh, uh, you know, in that direction. Every time this has happened in the past, where you have that special ability, you find something new and unexpected, whether it's pulsars or quasars, all the, you know, the whole history of astronomy points to the value of serendipity here. But I have to say, despite the fact that we've been doing uh, radio SETI experiments since 1960, I don't know that we've made any astronomy discoveries as a consequence of that. It's interesting because you think it'd be there. I mean, it seems if you're going to look at 1420, well, Seems like a good way to study the hydrogen clouds, the Milky Way, doesn't it? Um, well, yeah, but you would, if, if that's what you want to do, actually, you build an instrument that is a little different than SETI. SETI is just looking for a signal. If you want to study the hydrogen line, because that would tell you things, uh, you build a, a somewhat different receiver. But that's a technical thing. And in fact, of course, there's been a lot of work in studying the hydrogen line coming from the sky. Uh, I used to make uh, my, my daily bread by doing stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. You started uh, in the hydrogen uh, area of, of radio astronomy. Do we have a good handle on that yet? Do we, I mean, do we have a really good mapping of that? And I know that, that the Big Ear did that initially before it moved to SETI. But I mean, do we have a really, really comprehensive map of the gas of this galaxy now? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, I, you can always improve it. You can always, you know, use new instruments to refine the detail or the sensitivity and things like that. But, you know, it's like it's like the maps of the world that were made in, you know, 1600, right? They, they weren't perfect. There was a lot of the Canadian Arctic that they didn't know about. Obviously, they didn't know about Antarctica and so forth and so on. But that map, and you could put it on a globe, it was, there was enough, there were enough data to put on a globe, was pretty good, particularly compared to what, for example, the Romans had, right? So, you could say that the majority of the job had been done. I think that's somewhat true for the study of the hydrogen line in our galaxy, too. Now, can you collect up information uh, you know, using surveys like that about the motion of that hydrogen? In other words, can you see blue and red shift in the, in the signal that tells you that these clouds are moving in a certain way and gives you sort of an idea of the dynamics of the movement of gas in the Milky Way? Yeah, of course, that was realized uh, early on. That was the big advantage of studying the hydrogen line, because if you have a line of any kind, <laughs> if there's some frequency that that signal is at, you know, you generate it in the lab and it's at 1420.4059, whatever, uh, megahertz, if you know that, then it's very easy to see deviations from that uh, rest frequency, that frequency you'd measure in the lab, due to the Doppler shift, the gas is either moving toward you or away from you. And if you couple that with a, just a very simple assumption, 
that all the motions in the Milky Way are kind of circular, that the Milky Way is like, if you will, a record on a turntable, except that this record uh, does, it doesn't all rotate together as one object. You know, you, you, every, every bit of gas can rotate at its own orbital speed. Then you can map, indeed, the galaxy, at least in the hydrogen line. And that was done even in the 50s and 60s. Uh, that sort of work was done. And it's, for astronomy, it's very interesting because it tells you about the structure of the Milky Way galaxy, which for us, that's our home galaxy. But it's difficult to figure out what it really looks like because we're in it. And that makes it difficult to get the overview. Yeah, that and that a lot of what we can't see. <laughs> um, now, back to SETI, what is the profile of distance? In other words, do you just not bother with very distant known exoplanets because the chances of a signal getting through are, are low? And do you focus more on nearby worlds first? And is it sort of a moving outward type of thing? What's the map of SETI searches? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there have been some SETI searches that have uh, trained their antennas on things that are very far away, including other galaxies that are very far away. But in general, what you say is true. You just, you know, you choose your targets on the basis of distance. And the majority of SETI searches have been done on star systems that are within, say, 100 or 200 light years. That's kind of the, uh, the outer edge, if you will, 200 light years of what has been done for SETI. Now, I mean, the signals will be the signals would be stronger, obviously, if the uh, aliens are closer. Yeah, well, we also don't know what their technology is. They may see value in gigantic signals, you know, um, but they may not. And it may be very, very subtle, which I don't know. Could we say that now that the original idea of Coconian Morrison, as Rick Hall, was looking for beacons? Can we eliminate that? Can we say, well, we've looked enough and we haven't seen any huge, crazy beacons that must be more subtle? Can we do that? I, I would say no, but, but that's a judgment call. Uh, I, I don't know that we've so comprehensively looked in all directions. I mean, uh, yeah, there could be signals that we've missed. I mean, they, they could be very nearby, but only have a relatively weak transmitter, and we just don't find them. And there's always the function of time and that, you know, we may not exist close enough right now in time to see another civilization. But if we look in 50,000 years, there it is. So this is also, there's a function of time here as well as the number of civilizations. So it's not really surprising that at this point we can say we've only still just started looking because we I need think, to look for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. When people say, why haven't you found anything? That's the reason I give. You know, we haven't looked long enough and hard enough. Yeah, and it's it shouldn't be surprising that we haven't seen it yet because we have a lot of work to do. Do. Um, now, with the Allen Telescope Array, at being an array, can you actually look at multiple targets at once? Well, you can do that, uh, but then you need multiple receivers. Normally, what is done is you use all the elements of the array, all those te little telescopes that are dotted on the, uh, you know, dotting the landscape, and you essentially use them as one telescope. The advantage of doing that is that you can focus in on specific spots on the sky. Right. So it's not used where each antenna is doing its own thing. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. <laughs>